Good morning, everybody. Come on, we can do better than that. Good morning, everybody. Morning. That's better. Cool. Uh, can I just get a quick show of hands before I begin? Uh, how many people here are developers? And how many people here are designers? OK, so we've got a good mix. Cool. OK, hopefully I've got something for everybody. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about optimizing our workflow for performance. Um, my name is Andy Smith, as you can probably tell from the really big text I've put up here. Uh, and you can follow me on Twitter, at Andy Smith. And when I'm not testing space hoppers, uh, I am the director of web development at AKQA, uh, where I run a team of web developers, and we work on lots of cool and exciting clients like Nike and Mini and BBC. Uh, and we also run our own tech event, which occurs every two or three months, uh, called Tech Insight, uh, which I really recommend you check out. Uh, we do different talks on different things. So, for example, we did one last week on health and fitness, where we had someone from Google come in and talk about Android fitness, uh, someone talk about uh, Zombies Run, and someone talk about um, a Nike Training Club. Uh, and you might, uh, may, might be wondering who I am, um, but you might be surprised to know that I actually feature in every issue of Net Magazine. Uh, so yeah, on this page. You, you can't miss it. I'm just there. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, I've done some uh, articles for Net Magazine. I did one on uh, mastering the browser developer tools. Uh, and I uh, got the cover that time. I was excited. Um, but also I did some on like responsive images. Um, and some baby news. Uh, my wife is expecting our first baby in uh, January. And when I was practicing this talk uh, to my wife the other day, uh, I felt my baby kick for the first time. So like, I don't know if that's an indication that the talk's really good and the baby's going, yeah, come on, daddy, or whether the baby was like, can I get out of here, please? Like, got to. <laughs> Not again, please, no. Um, yeah, so I was going to put a picture of the baby and the photo of the baby scan on the screen. And then I, my wife was like, I don't really want my uterus being displayed on a massive screen to all these people. So, so I didn't do that in the end. Um, cool. So if you've uh, previously seen any of my other talks, you know that I advocate the use of task runners often. Uh, and the reasons I do this is because we can automate our workflow, we can reduce repetition, we can reduce our errors, and we can hopefully reduce our pain. Um, it saves us from having to repeat the boring tasks again and again and again, and potentially get them wrong. And it also means that we can free up our time to do other more interesting things. Uh, so if we spend some time getting our tools right at the start, then we don't have to uh, have the wrong setup whilst we're building, and we don't end up with a bicycle with square wheels, for example. Uh, and there's a number of different uh, tools that we can use to um, work on our workflow. Uh, two of the most popular are Grunt and Gulp. Uh, and uh, at this stage, they're both um, fairly mature. Uh, but there's a couple of different dif uh, differences. So Grunt is more like a configuration-based setup, whereas Gulp's uh, a bit more code. Um, Grunt runs our tasks sequentially, so one after the other, whilst uh, Gulp uh, we'll try and run our tasks uh, concurrently. Uh, and Grunt will write all of our um, output back to the file system each time, whereas Grunt, uh, Gulp will run it in streams, which is actually faster. So uh, can I just get a quick show of hands who's using either Grunt or Gulp here? Awesome. Who's been meaning to check out Grunt or Gulp and hasn't got around to it yet? <laughs> you really should get around to it. Cool. So. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about tasks that we can use to optimize our performance. And I'll release the slides at the end, so don't worry about writing down URLs or uh, NPM install paths. Um, you don't need to take notes. But first of all, why would we optimize our site performance? Well, to help me illustrate this point, I've asked my friend Kevin to come along. Why should browsing the web make your face do this? It's buffer face, right? So this is our advert. Hopefully, most of you have seen it. It's not as choppy on the TV. But um, uh, it's an advert from EE that's promoting their 4G network. But 
Um, a lot of things apply to uh, performance on the web and the way how we build mobile websites, right? Whenever you build a, a badly performing mobile site, I want to you to imagine that your users are doing this face, okay? So how long will our users wait? Uh, well, according to web usability consultant Jacob Nielsen, uh, if we can uh, get an interaction to happen within 100 milliseconds, then it feels like uh, our site is instantly reacting. So if we've got something like uh, more info or show comments or something like that, we expect something to happen within the first sort of 100 milliseconds. Uh, if we're waiting about a second, then it feels like our computer is like work working on the request, and users kind of accept this. They're like, yeah, something's happening, okay. By the time we get to like 10 seconds, our users are getting bored, they're, they're giving up. And we've probably all done it, right? You're on your mobile phone on the train or something, and you're looking at mobile site, and it doesn't load, and you either hit the reload button multiple times in the hope that it might appear, or you get bored and you do something else. And when you're on a mobile device, you've only got uh, one screen and one window, so you basically you're just gonna leave that experience and go somewhere else. And there's been some good case studies into performance and how it can affect um, uh, large sites that we know. So for example, uh, Amazon uh, famously did um, a study where they added an extra 100, 100 milliseconds wait, and it was costing them about 1% in sales. Similarly, Google uh, added an extra 500 milliseconds wait to search uh, results traffic, and it was uh, dropping uh, their traffic by 20%. So how do we test for performance? Um, so there's a tool available called uh, webpagetest.org, um, and this allows us to be able to measure the speed index of our page. So this is the average time in which visible parts of our page take uh, to display. So here I've got a few examples. I've removed the culprit's names um, of how long different things take in a speed index. So Google's recommendation is that we try to aim for a speed index of 1,000, which is about one second. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the speed index is actually improving on repeat views because we are uh, caching, caching our responses. Uh, and there's also this really useful thing in web page test. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see there's like this cost link. Um, and the cost link uh, shows us how much our website will cost on different mobile devices in different countries. So we can actually see how much our site is costing on a data plan in different countries. And we've also got uh, a way of being able to um, test page speed with Google. So they've got Google, uh, page speed insights. And you simply go to this URL, and you can enter in um, the URL to your site, and it will give you a summary of what the good and the bad parts of your, are of your site. And it will give you suggestions on how you can fix things. So why do we have to wait in the first place? Well, page size, that's a pretty obvious one, right? The bigger the page is, the, the longer we have to wait. Too many requests. So every request we do has like a setup cost associated, it, associated with it, time we have to wait. Uh, latency, so if you're not sure what latency is, if you've ever seen a um, news presenter be talk, talking to someone in Australia, for example, that time we wait for the, the question to go to the person, for them to answer, to come back, that's an example of latency. And that's the amount of time uh, for our round trip to happen. Uh, blocking scripts, so if we've got scripts on our page that are blocking the render of our page, uh, and connection speed. So at the moment, our page sizes don't seem to be getting any smaller. They actually seem to be getting bigger. And experienced designer Stephanie Riga uh, noted that we spend more time focusing on the visual design of our responsive websites than we do on the performance of our websites. So we make sure that everything looks great on an iPhone or looks great on an iPad, but we don't actually spend time um, optimizing the file size. So we're all guilty of it. We have a carousel, for example, on a desktop. And for mobile, we just hide the carousel or we just show an image or something. But we're still loading in that code. And that code's still being downloaded to the mobile device. It just looks prettier. So let's have a look at how we can optimize our website for performance. Essentially, we need to fix the weight. We need to do the opposite of all those um, things that we're saying that was taking our time for uh, waiting. So we need fewer requests. We need a smaller page size. We need to ensure we don't have blocking scripts. We need to try and reduce latency. Uh, and we need to have a look at connection speed. 
So let's start with smaller page size. So if you take a look at the average number of bytes um, for the top one million websites, there's a pretty uh, guilty culprit here. <laughs> Images are taking up a lot of uh, the resources that we're downloading. They're over 50%. And the next, next offender is scripts, which is actually quite, quite small compared to images. So images are actually taking up a lot of our um, website budget. Um, but no amount of optimization in the world is gonna save us if we've got 27 images on our homepage. We, can't, we, we can optimize those images, but the problem needs to start at the root. Um, so we need to start, start by setting a performance budget. And this is defined by how long we'd like someone to wait um, for our page to load. So perhaps our client might have a non-functional requirement about what they uh, expect for our um, site to load. Or if we don't get some guidance from the client, we can have a look at our competitors' page sizes and um, have a look at how their sites perform to try and guide us into uh, what would be an ideal time for our page to load. And a performance budget will basically set a baseline for our page size and the number of requests. And then we can consider the number of images and the number of fonts and the number of carousels they have on our page and work out if they're really worth it. So we can deliver this really performant, really optimized site. So if we have a look at some uh, tasks available in our workflow, uh, let's start with responsive images. Um, so there's no point in us serving images to a mobile phone um, which is, say, 2,000 pixels wide. We're just sending wasted pixels. Um, we're better off resizing images so that they fit on the devices that we want. And there's a task available for both Grunt and Gulp that allows us to be able to plug in an image and it will output some smaller images for us. So here you can see I've got an image of a car. And yeah, I just plug it into my workflow. It resizes the images in a variety of sizes and then I can use the source set or the picture element um, to be able to display our image. Uh, how, does up how many people are currently using responsive images on their websites? Cool. How many people feel confident they know the difference between source set and picture? <laughs> Smaller amount, cool. Um, so what is the difference between source set and picture? So if we're dealing with um, size or DPI, so you can see here we've got exactly the same image on a mobile device. It's got the same, same background, the same car. Um, then we should be using uh, the image tag with the source set um, attribute. And we can also use this sizes attribute to be able to change the um, uh, size of the image in the viewport. So we can uh, use that to measure what our breakpoints are. If instead what we're doing is we're changing the art direction, so here you can see I've got the picture of the car with the, um, the beach scenario. But here I'm actually focusing in on the car. I'm uh, highlighting what I actually want the user to view. Um, I'm changing the art direction. Then we should be using the picture element. And here we specify um, the number of sources that we want, and then we specify a fullback image. So yeah, so if we're resizing or we're changing the pixel density, we should be using source set. If the art direction is changing or we're changing the uh, type of the image, so perhaps we're support, supporting WebP for some browsers, then we'd use the picture element. Uh, and there's this really good article on the Opera Developer Center, uh, which I've got linked to at the bottom here, which goes through all the combinations of these because it's, it's not necessarily just as straightforward as you're just resizing um, or you're changing the pixel density, but it, it goes through all the different examples and shows you um, when is the right time to use the different things. And the, the support for source set and picture is pretty good. Um, you can see here that source set uh, is supported by edge, so it slightly has the edge. Bad joke, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, but even if we don't uh, have browser support, there is a polyfill we can use. Um, so this picture fill, uh, polyfill has been around for quite a while. It's been for a few iterations. Um, we can safely use that on our page. So our browser will download the, the uh, fullback image, and when the JavaScript um, triggers, then it will replace it with the responsive image that we need. Uh, the second task we can use is we can compress our images. And this sounds like a simple thing to do, but you'd be surprised how many people aren't doing it. 
Um, so this task called Grunt Contrib Image Min or Gulp Image Min can re resize your JPEGs, your PNGs, your GIFs. It also uses SVGO, um, which you may or may want, not want to use. Um, <laughs> but um, it, it takes a little bit from each image. So if we can save a few bytes from each image and we've got, say, 20 images on our page, that's actually quite a big saving. So here's a picture of me and my cat. Um, and you can see, yeah, I've, I've saved a bunch of uh, kilobytes by changing, uh, by optimizing my image. Uh, so another thing we can do is we can remove unused CSS. So how many people here are using like a UI framework like Twitter Bootstrap? Yeah, there's a few of you. Um, so yeah, if we're using a UI framework like Twitter Bootstrap or Foundation or Skeleton or something like that, uh, chances are we're not using all of the CSS code that's included. Um, we're probably only using 10 or 20% of it. So why are we sending it to the user for them to download? Let's optimize that earlier on uh, before it gets sent to the user. Um, and we can use a task like grunt uncss or gulp uncss to uh, optimize uh, and produce a smaller output, which is just the stuff that we're using on our page. And this just doesn't just apply to frameworks, too. If you've got multiple developers working on something, maybe there's a different approach taken at a certain point. Or if you've got a bug, maybe you don't go and uh, tidy up your code afterwards. This can all help with these kinds of things. And then we can also um, do things like minification and uglification, which um, hopefully most of you are, are doing. So by minifying, I mean we're removing unnecessary space. We're removing line breaks and indentation. And uglifying, we're kind of mangling our code so that it's a smaller size by renaming our functions and variables and things. Um, but rather than kind of point out the obvious tasks um, for this, I thought I'd uh, talk, to you about, um, I'd talk to you about Usemin, which also does concatenation, which will help for um, having fewer requests. So Usemin will run these performance helpers for us automatically. So we don't need to set up our concat and our um, minify and our uglify individually. We can just set Usemin to do this for us. It will just run through a, a set of tasks for us and update our HTML. So the setup in our HTML is relatively straightforward. We just add this build script at the top, and then we specify our um, CSS files, and then just end the build script, and this will output to main.min.css. Similarly, we can do the same with our JavaScript, output to main.min.js. And so an example setup, this one's in Gulp, is we just have to set this prepare task that says what HTML we want um, Usemin to have a look at, uh, and then we can just point to where our asset folders are. And the task order for this, you can, you can define. Uh, I've got concat, CSS, min, uglify, file rev that I'm going to talk about in a minute, um, and then I run Usemin and then I minify my HTML. Um, and we can also compress our files within our workflow if we want. I personally prefer to do uh, my gzipping in my deployment script um, because it uh, can affect things like live reload. But you can compress your files within your workflow if you want. There's a task called uh, grunt contrib compress or gulp gzip that we can use for that. Uh, and we can also employ lazy loading, um, which there isn't um, a workflow task for. But if we've got a carousel, for example, we can consider not loading in the other images of the carousel until until the page is loaded, or we can load lower parts of the page later on once, once the initial page is loaded. Uh, and we can combine like, um, our workflow with like a file mod or module loader like require.js to, to optimize this. So that's smaller page size, but let's talk about fewer requests. So we've already spoken about concatenation of files, so joining all our CSS together or joining all our JavaScript together, but we can also join together all our images. And there's nothing more fiddly than having to create your own sprite file within Photoshop and align each of the images carefully and then work out the pixels that it is for the background positioning. Um, and there's a task available for our workflow that can do it for us. There's a task called SpriteSmith. Um, and it will output the CSS with all the different background positions for our sprites. And like all the major players are using sprites. Like this is the Amazon sprite sheet. And it's pretty much every icon and everything you need to, to build an Amazon.com website. Um, so it's definitely worth looking into. Similarly, um, ideally what we want to be able to do is um, load 
all the HTML and CSS that we need for that initial view that the user sees, the above the fold view, um, within our first 14 kilobytes. Um, and by doing this, it means it'll be in the first request and we can paint it to our browser as soon as possible. And there's a task available um, called uh, Critical CSS, or Penthouse for Grunt, that um, will do this. It will run through our page, it will work out what our CSS is required to display our header or our hero, or whatever you happen to have at the top of your page, and it will allow you to output it in line in, uh, in CSS, which will help get our page to render quicker um, in our browser. In terms of no blocking scripts, uh, there's not really a workflow task that can help with this. This is more of a, a best practice. Ideally, you should be putting your scripts at the bottom of the page. Um, you can use um, script async, which will um, load your scripts without blocking um, your render of your page, and it will just block render at the point where they execute. Um, there's also a script defer, but um, it's a bit buggy in Internet Explorer. Um, it works in the same way as async, except for the uh, with defer, it loads them in the order that they're specified on the page, whereas with async, it will just load them as soon as they've um, downloaded from the server. So um, we can also reduce latency. Um, so we can have a look at um, using a CDN or a content delivery network. Um, the problem um, with displaying our sites is, say we've got our site hosted in San Francisco, um, we can only get data to us um, at a certain speed. So if we take into account like, the speed of light, it's still going to take about 30 milliseconds for us to get a request to San Francisco and from San, San Francisco to send the request back. So that's like 60, 60 milliseconds altogether. So ideally, you want like, a, a distributed content delivery network. So if you have a, a CDN that's in uh, Ireland or in a CDN that's in Asia, for example, then you'll be able to deliver content to your users um, a lot more efficiently. Uh, and we can also consider some domain sharding. So domain sharding is like splitting resources across multiple domains, um, which allows our browsers to be able to download more resources simultaneously, which can result in a faster page load. Um, but too, ma too much domain sharding is a bad thing, as Etsy found out. Um, they had four uh, domains that they were loading resources from, and they actually found it was making their page performance worse. Uh, and we can use concatenation again, so we can combine all our resources together. And then in terms of connection speed, we can't really tell our users to go and uh, get a better network plan or move to a country with a better uh, broadband. Um, but we can deal with cache, right? So we can cache um, files on our server, and we can make it really easy for us to be able to maintain those cached files within our workflow. So we can use this task called file rev, a grunt file rev or gulp file rev, um, which will si assign uh, file revision numbers to our um, code. So file rev will go through and rename our uh, files based on the file contents. So it looks through the file's contents and it creates a hash of those, um, those contents as like a six, six uh, hexadecimal number. So here we've got main.a1, b2, c3.css. Uh, and that means that we can set our cache on our server to um, like really high, like two months or two years or whatever we need, as long as we keep our HTML with a, a much shorter cache. Uh, and then whenever we make a change to those files, we don't have to worry about needing to invalidate the cache, because uh, FileRev will actually create a new file name. So as soon as we make a change, uh, we'll just end up with another file, like main.d4e5f6.css. So that can be really handy for us um, to deal with caching on our site. So if we have a look at the summary of some of the tasks we've looked at, we've got smaller page size. We spoke about responsive images, image optimization, unused CSS, minify and uglify. We've got fewer requests. So we've got concatenation, sprite images, critical CSS. And we've got connection speed we can improve um, by caching our files. But what happens after go live? Uh, well, we can continue to measure our performance. Uh, we can uh, use both Grunt and Gulp to be able to measure um, our performance budget through web page test and also our page speed. Uh, so we could set up a little workflow that runs through those and perhaps reports back whenever, um, whenever something goes wrong so we can keep uh, running that. We can also set up alerts in like our analytics. So Google Analytics has what's known as intelligence events. 
And what you can do is you can say, whenever, say, my uh, average page load time increases by a certain amount that wasn't last week, um, send me an email, and it will just let you know when your page is starting to perform badly um, so that you can do something about it. But one of the uh, most common things I find is um, we optimize and optimize and optimize a site, and then we hand it over to some content authors. And we go from, it, it, like in a week, we have a, go from like a 200 kilobyte image on the home page to a five megabyte image on the home page. And our site goes from being super fast to being as slow as a milk float. Um, so part of this is uh, training of um, content authors, making sure that they're aware of performance as well. But perhaps there's also a way you can like um, hook in your workflow into your CMS. So every time a content author uploads an image, then we have a mini uh, workflow that runs that perhaps uh, runs responsive images and outputs a bunch of sizes and then optimizes those images. So we never hit that problem where, um, uh, where we're getting five megabyte images on our homepage. So in conclusion, if we design with a performance budget, um, we, we're going to ensure that our pages aren't doomed from the start. We can use a workflow to save us pain. Uh, we can optimize our images, CSS and JavaScript. And we can educate the people who are going to be maintaining the site to ensure that when it goes live, our site still performs um, as we expect. There's a really, really, really quiet sound effect. Oh, there we are. That's better. <laughs> cool. Annoying sound effect's over. There's a challenger approaching, right? HTTP2. Uh, and HTTP2 changes things a bit. So HTTP2 allows us uh, to have one connection that can download multiple resources in parallel. So we no longer have a connection um, per resource and then end up queuing our resources, um, which is what we suffered from in HTTP1. Um, we don't have head of line blocking anymore. Instead, we can like multiplex our um, resources together so they're all going in one stream and we can um, have like a HTML and CSS on the same stream. Uh, HTTP2 is binary rather than textual. Um, so uh, with HTTP1, um, it defined like four ways to pass um, a message with text, but there's only one way with HTTP2. Uh, so we don't have to worry about things like white space handling, capitalization, line endings, and that kind of thing anymore. So we have like a lower pass overhead and there's uh, less chance of errors. Uh, we've also got better comp uh, header compression. Um, so every time uh, we have a resource, we send things like user agents and caching information, that kind of thing. Um, with HTTP2, we're compressing that using HPAC. Um, and this is then encoded to ensure that we reduce our transfer size. So here you can see, um, sorry, HPAC also allows us to uh, keep an index of our um, previous headers. So rather than sending the same header information again and again and again, uh, we can keep an index of it. So here you can see um, I've got some request headers and I'm pretty much always going to be sending the method get unless I'm doing a form post. So we can actually, um, it actually puts it into a lookup table and it just sends the index of that lookup table. Um, so we don't need to keep sending the same information again and again. And this can reduce the number of bytes. Uh, and uh, HTTP2 also allows us um, to push responses to our client. So we can send our CSS before it's requested. So we no longer have to wait for um, a HTML to go, ooh, I've got a CSS file here. We can send it already. Um, we can send it and it'll be cached on the client ready for use. So this is not like WebSockets. The code won't be executed until the client requests it. But when it is requested, it won't have to wait for it to be downloaded because it's already downloaded it. Um, so it's pretty handy. So when can I start using HTTP2? Well, in terms of browser support, it's looking quite good. Um, all the browsers are only supporting the HTTPS version. Um, in terms of um, IE and Edge, uh, we're only looking at support in Windows 10 at the moment. In terms of what the servers are supporting, um, we're looking like we're going to probably get support from most of the um, server software by the end of 2015. So Nginx have an alpha that's available now. 
Um, Apache um, support it via patching at the moment. It will be available in the next release. And it's also available in IIS for Windows 10. And it's important to remember that uh, everything's backwards compatible with HTTP 1.x, so uh, you don't have to worry about, oh, maybe a, you know, the server's only going to support HTTP 2, or what happens. There is a necessary fallback in there. So if we have a look at optimizing our website for um, HTTP 2 and how that affects our performance, we need to change a few things. So rather than having fewer requests, we actually want to have smaller requests. So we actually want to start um, avoiding concatenation. Ideally, what we want to do is we want to be uh, downloading our resources as soon as possible so we can start executing them. And if you've put all your JavaScript into one file, you've still got to wait for that entire file to download before you can execute it. But if you've got your JavaScript for your head in a separate file, then you can execute that earlier and um, you can start using your navbar or, or whatever. Um, and we don't need to inline resources anymore because the whole uh, server push kind of replaces that. We can just push the CSS that we need for uh, critical page load. We don't need to inline it into our HTML. So with HTTP2, we should be loading resources on demand. And here's a small demo. Um, that I've borrowed from uh, HTTP2demo.io, which shows how images load on HTTP1 and how they load on HTTP2. So as you can see with, uh, with HTTP1, um, we're looking at 1.27 seconds, um, but you can see it's much, much faster with HTTP2. Um, so this is 200 small images, by the way. Um, but you can see the already the benefits. Uh, we should also um, look at reducing latency. Um, so I'm not saying don't use a CDN. It's probably a bit silly. But you want to um, minimize the number of extra domains you're requesting, because you've still got to do the TCP request every time you want to add another domain. Um, and we should probably reduce or remove domain sharding. But there's things that are still important, right? We still need smaller page size. We still need to optimize our images. We still need to avoid non-blocking uh, scripts. Um, so there's still lots of important optimizations. And if we, if we have a look at the tools that I recommended uh, in the first section against the, uh, what we should do in the second section, you can see that, um, yes, we should still be doing responsive images. Yes, we should be still minifying our images. Um, we shouldn't be um, spriting, or we should if, if we do need to sprite, say we've got three icons in the header that we just join those together, we don't combine them with everything on the page. Um, we don't need to inline our CSS anymore, but we still want to be minifying and uglifying our code, because we still need to think about uh, the amount that we're transferring over the wire. So you're, if you want to know more about HTTP2, uh, you can check out the GitHub repo, which has um, loads of information and documentation about how HTTP2 works. Um, and there's also this quite good blog post that goes into a um, bit more detail about how everything works. It's really hard to say HTTP2 a lot. It's a bit of a tongue twister. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's uh, the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Um, may your websites be more performant.